is the business case for net zero. As the world faces rising energy costs and global inflationary pressures, the case for net zero by 2050 might be under question. But my guest today, Russell Fortmeyer, Woods Baggett's global head of sustainability, argues the business case has never been stronger. Well, visiting Australia from California, Russell joins me now to argue the case. Russell, welcome to Smarter <laughs> Cities. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. How's your trip been? You've had, we were just talking outside, you've had quite the uh, series of events. You were in the Gold Coast, you were, you know, met a lot of clients, we're now here in Sydney. What's it been like? Yeah, um, I've pretty much everywhere I've gone, I, I started in uh, Melbourne and then I went to Perth and Adelaide. I'm wrapping up in Sydney. Uh, meeting with clients all along the way and really talking about carbon, uh, trying to understand where their business is at, what their client, what their clients are asking for. I mean, it is the topic of conversation. I think at the Property Congress, you know, if I were clicking how many times I heard somebody on the stage say carbon or decarbonization or electrification, it is definitely on everyone's minds and not necessarily in their projects yet. Yeah, I mean, that's a very, very interesting point. I think uh, I want to get into a lot of that, particularly this notion of the business case of net zero, because if I, I recall uh, when we met last week, you've been using that line as a means of being provocative. So I'm going to be provocative back. But before we get into all of that, um, you've got a pretty interesting background. You've, you've lived in several cities in the sustainability engineering space. I, I'm always interested in how people get to do what they're doing. What got you into this? So I, start, I started my career as an electrical engineer, um, and uh, you know that was what twenty over twenty years ago, twenty some years ago. And at that time, at least in our industry, and this was in architect, you know, within an architectural um, frame. Um, but at that time in our industry, there wasn't much you could do as an this electrical was in the engineer. States. This was in the states. I started my career in Los Angeles, and uh, you know. It was kind of code compliance. And I just thought as an engineer, as a creative engineer, where, where do you go with this, right? It's like anybody can do this. Um, and so I started to kind of educate myself on where our industry was moving in a, in a wider direction. And, and I started my career as lead became a thing. I was one of the first lead APs uh, within the firm. I was, I was working at Arup um, out of college. I became a lead AP. We had a green group. I got more interested in seeing how we could take this multidisciplinary engineering practice that that Arab really was then and position it toward this kind of green economy. I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking of, of climate change being the crisis that we think of it now, we take for granted. I mean, at the time it was, how do we lessen environmental impact of the built environment, right? Uh, that's sort of where I came at it from. Um, and so, you know, the more I educated myself, the more I was like, oh, you know, um, there's there's more to be done beyond just electrical engineering here. Um, and and we need somebody to kind of think about this more holistically that can sit across these specialty, uh, you know, practices, disciplines of mechanical, plumbing, structural, architecture. Um, and so my, you know, my career coming of age, I think, sort of dovetailed nicely with the emergence of sustainability as a field, right? And as and, and sustainable design as something that uh, could play a role in every project. So um, I just kind of moved into that territory uh, and just started working in it. That's it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting you say that, right? Because I mean, so many guests I have on sort of say that they they fell into something or they saw a mega trend or it sounds to me like that's kind of what the, the, what you kind of found well you know within an engineering environment i mean obviously we know arab well to see that there's a trend towards um better uh better practice of sustainability right well i i had stepped away from engineering for a couple of years and i worked as a technology editor for architectural record which is a magazine oh you became a journalist i became a journalist for a couple of years <laughs> and um i've always you know i've always been a writer and 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 worked as a journalist in college strangely enough um and in so in my journalistic practices i was focusing on um 
this emerging field of sustainability globally. And I was meeting all of the players. I was talking to all these architects who were pushing this. And I kind of did that for a couple of years. And I thought, well, I, I need to get back into this. Like, this is what I'm really interested in. Just writing about it wasn't enough. Writing about it wasn't enough. I felt like, I felt like that's, that's the, the field for me. So I went back, that's when I went back into engineering, just strictly around sustainability. Um, and I've been doing that since ever since. So that's like whatever, two thousand eight or something. I, I, I do, I do feel the sort of practice of sustainability has started to evolve and become less technical and more, more easier for people or simple development people like me to understand. Like if I if I started <laughs> if I start you know thinking about my sustainability colleagues who will probably murder me for saying things like this. Um, you know, a lot of it is quite technical and you can get really down to the weeds of building design and, you know, right down to material design and all of it extremely important for, for sort of a person like me who's sort of on the origination side of things and pulling it all together. We just kind of want to know it's zero or it's, mm -hmm. it, it's sustainable. Right. Tell me it's sustainable. And I think the function, <laughs> it's true, right? The function, the function particularly in government bids and government tenders like you know the it will say explain how this is sustainable and section seven of the tender document will be sent out to the sustainability team write a bunch of stuff in this that says this thing is sustainable great tick right i think we're moving a lot of we've moved substantially away from that now to a far more educated and intelligent conversation around what does sustainability actually mean and how does it actually improve built form, urban environment, and um, and standard of living for people? And mm -hmm. I would say that you know the firm I work with, Lend Lease, it, sustainability has been really, really important for us. It, it, we, you know, we were one of the global leaders of it. Uh, a lot of our precincts were already carbon zero um, well before this became a, a topic of conversation. And now, you know, our board and executive have set, you know, net zero by 2025 already achieved. Absolute zero by 2040 is the terrifying one for me because we don't know how to get there, right? So right. I'm, I'm curious, what are you, have you seen that change in the sustainability function? Yeah, so I, I want to say two things in response to that point. The first, the first one will be more provocative than the second one. Um, because I have seen, um, I mean, I, I, ma I managed this, I've managed a sustainability team for like the last 12 or 13 years, right? That's kind of what, what I did. And when I would meet students and I've also taught, I've taught at the Southern California Institute of Architecture for 11 years and I teach architects, environmental systems and sustainability, um, and so I've, I've always had a very heavy hand in academia. So I'm always willing to tell students, give a students advice for this emerging sustainability economy. But I certainly would say this to, to students who are wanting to come work with our team, um, is that, and this is where it'll get maybe a little controversial, is with this emergence... It's only you and me here. Right, fine. right, nobody else. <laughs> is that with the emergence of sustainability as, as a field in design, there have been a lot of academic programs who have, that, that have sprung up all of a sudden about sustainability. And I would meet students who are like, oh, I'm taking this class that's all about LEED. And I just think, why are you paying for that? Yeah. Why are you at, at, at university studying a rating tool, right? Like, I don't want to say that that's useless, but that's useless. And and my advice... Just learn the tool and be done with it, right? Well, you don't have to take a course. Right. And, like, stay up late one night and read the manual. Like, you can get through it. Um, but, the, but the point is, is that what makes a team work, what, what can tackle the challenges that are emerging in projects is not some sort of generalist, you know, like, oh, I've studied LEED, I and mean, that's that's not knowledge, right? Um, it's it's subject matter expertise in a field that, I, you know, is related to these principles, right? So I'm like, I'd rather hire a physicist. I would rather hire a material scientist, right? Somebody who has really deep knowledge of, of the way the world works, 
you know, and and has an analytical mind about how the like the, the analytical mind aspect is so key. And then the rest you can learn, yeah. right? right? The rest is is how you flavor that. And I think that's where personally, I think that's where education and the academy is failing us right now is we're training people to understand these kind of business processes, but not these fundamental questions, right? And that and I look, I'm a I'm I'm a science person. So of course I'm gonna fall on on the science side, but there is the social side of this that I think is is more important than ever. Well, it, it probably is the thing that's the most important mm. is is the social impact of the way we consume resources and what it's doing to our planet. Um, and and who pays the price for that. That's that side of it, you know, is is definitely emerging. And I don't, again, I don't see people coming out of academia that really know how to take that on. I, I would agree. I, 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 I wouldn't say that that is exclusive to this topic. No. I think if you look across the board, you know, in how our university systems are working and the training that people are getting uh, and the courses that are coming out, they're very much tailored to trends, you know. So you mm -hmm. can now do uh, a, a university degree in climate change. I don't really know what that means, you know, like, or right. you could do a university degree in some type of, uh, some type of mega trend, or, or you might do it in that that's coming in. And those degrees kind of, they seem very fashionable, right? They, they seem are very fashionable. Absolutely. And the graduates you meet that do have done these courses kind of graduate thinking, oh, I know about climate change. Okay, that's really great. But how does that actually help you in a business environment, right? Or, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I studied international politics as my, one of my uh, degrees, um, and I did it purely for fun, right? And I love telling the story because you know, my background is economics and business and mm -hmm. finance and whatever. Those are my degrees. But, but the international politics one was fascinating. I loved it. It was, you know, I looked all into, into the Middle East and oil economy and East Timor at that time, you know, it was a big debate about the joint petroleum development area. I found it fascinating. And my professor at the time, he came in, he said, we're going to have his careers day. So, you know, if you want to find out what type of taxi you're going to be driving, whether it's going to be a white one or a silver one, go to this careers day. <laughs> and I do feel some of these university degrees sort of end up, you know, really leading students down the garden path, away from practical analytical solutions to things that probably you would learn faster if you were delved into it and got into the workplace faster. So right. I don't know. I mean, perhaps you, know, you you think that's controversial. I don't know. Is it controversial? <laughs> well, I think there's still those those degree programs are out there, and there's still. I mean, if you look at the job listings in the state of California on like LinkedIn. There are, there's probably 10,000 jobs with the word, title word sustainability. Yeah. And I look at that and, and I think, who are those people doing these jobs? Because I don't, they don't seem to be in my radar. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that they're not, that there aren't great, qualified, amazing people out there. But what I mean is that there's been a proliferation of sustainability within the business world you know, across all sectors. And no, and, and I don't think, I look at that and I think, okay, where's the evidence on the back of this investment that we're doing something, right? We are we have we made progress in 20 years? Ridiculous amounts of progress. Yeah, but it's not because of all of those. But roles. it's not because of those roles. Those roles are box ticking roles, right? I think so. Which is, you know, oh my goodness, we've got to do something about sustainability. We better hire a general manager of sustainability. <laughs> right. But we don't really know what problems are, and that's why I'm quite yeah. interested in, you know. What you're doing, and certainly our sustainability team at Lendlease is doing, it's actually about solving critical problems to do with how you actually reduce the impact of built form on the planet. Like that is a question, and right. around that, like if you look at, I, I always reflect on early on when you know we were pushing sustainability at Lendlease. The feedback generally from investors was, "You guys are amazing." This sustainability stuff is fantastic. We definitely want this, but we're not necessarily willing to pay for it. Right. Right? So rent in an office building, you know, yes, we'll pay a premium rent, but we're not going to pay an additional premium for your sustainability thing. We 
differentiated ourselves in the market by being a leader in this space. I think other competitors, you will have seen it, have now caught up to that and are now trying to do these things ourselves and we've gone further. We're going to say, well, absolute, absolute zero by 2040, that will be us, right? Um, you know, we, we've defined all the different scopes of emissions that we're going to, uh, that we're going to um, eliminate along the way without offsets and we're working on that, right? right. So that's, that's what a good sustainability team in my mind actually does. It's not a lip service type thing. It is an actual, well, actually, how do we solve these problems? And right. one, one of the questions that we're looking at at the moment, for example, is if, if it's the case that we have to be a net zero world and a net zero economy, I get it for new built form. The technology now exists to get us to that. What about existing built form? So if you've got embedded yeah. carbon, which we all know exists, you can't just demolish the building, buildings, entire cities. What do you do? There has to be a way of taking built form that is reached the end of its useful life and converting that into new built form without releasing embedded carbon. Is that something you guys are looking at? Absolutely. So, so I, I, I wanted to just finish. I mean, this is maybe a bit of a segue um, into that, but I wanted to f to finish the second part of my answer oh, to your please, yeah. previous question. This is question. the provocative part, right? Well, no, no, no. That was the provocative oh, part the because part. I'm like, I, we're discrediting probably a lot of people um, in the equation so, here. But what <laughs> the comment section is going to be very active. Well, what I would say, uh, so, so the second part of the question is, is, you know, what is the opportunity that I see at a company like Woods Back? Like, why am I at an architecture practice? Because that is what, what I think, I mean, I mean, the way we talk about it at Woods Bagot is that a sustainability practice has to be design led. I mean, that's what we do. We're, we're architects. We, we make architecture. We make places. We make cities. That, that is what people come to us looking for. And so, so sustainability through that lens must be expressed as, a, as an output of design and, and, or, or, or uh, you know, as a way to gauge the uh, measure design's success, right? Um, and I say that because I want to differentiate from companies that are in the sustainability business from an accounting perspective, mm -hmm. right? Like you don't come to Woods Bagot and ask us to, to calculate a carbon footprint. You come to us to design a building and tell you what the carbon impact is. I will say is that, that accounting right? thing is important though. You have, to, you have to be able to measure. I don't, I don't, yeah, yeah ab absolutely. hundred percent agree. Um, but I think that, you know, what I would say about an architecture practice that is, say, fundamentally different from an engineering practice, from, from my experience, is that we may, you know, Woods Bagot makes a place that has meaning and it has a story associated with it, right? It, it is an expression of identity. And um, maybe it's a community identity, maybe it's a corporate identity, who the, you know, who the client is and who the stakeholders are. Um, differs in, in the projects. But I, you know, I think this, this point about the social impact of architecture, right, is that an architects can help us frame uh, a, a response to the climate crisis in a way that brings meaning to our lives, our daily lives, right? I mean, to come here tonight to record this, I went through Winyard, uh, you know, Winyard Station, which has been completely reimagined by architecture, right? As as and it and it be, becomes a whole different experience from what Winyard was, whatever. It's now ten, a connect ten one. years ago. Right now, yeah. it's connected. It's a, it's a place. Mm. It has an identity. It, you know, that's not that it's not foreboding to go in there, right? Yeah. And so I think the you know, and that's a critical piece of infrastructure in the city. And so you know, when I when when we look at key projects at Woods Bagot, we're really looking at them. You know, like you look at the work. That we're doing at Central and in, in rethinking the the largest mobility hub for the city is like this is this is part of people's lives every day. And I think if you can foreground, you know, how these buildings uh, perform in a way that uh, reduces their impact, that brings community together, that really centers on people in that experience, I think, you know, that's what I find fascinating about my role there now. Um, is that I'm not just managing the carbon impact of our projects, right? 
Um, and that is, like you say, super, super important. But I get to work with all these people that really understand their communities and understand who they're designing for. And I, I think that, you know, that is that has changed a lot in in, in the 20 years or 20 plus years I've been in practice, you know, to really think about um, architecture as an expression of place, as of of kind of these social um, aims, as opposed to, you know, you go back and you look at 80s architecture, yeah. for example, and it's a style exercise, yeah, right? Time, time. And it just isn't anymore. And I think we take that for granted in our world that there's been this massive shift of like, well, there, you know, there certainly are, if you want style, there are architects out there that are just style and, um, you know, good luck. Um, and there's certain sectors that are still focused on style. You might look at some retail and think they're just focused on style. But I think even that has shifted. Yeah, right? I agree. I, I think it's interesting you say that. I think, you know, sustainability now, and I think you you made, you made this um, point in your remarks last week around ESG, there's... We kind of get the E, right? Right. Environmental, right. we're going to be net zero, get it, right? And we'll come back to that. The S is a really interesting, difficult, challenging question. And I look at you know, what we do in, in creating new parts of cities, which is what Lendlease does in partnership with Woodsbag and other, other firms, many of which including Arup and others. Um, and it really is about creating places for communities to thrive, which is actually one of our values at our firm. But I look at it in terms of all the bids that we're doing now around uh, all the projects we're doing. It's how do you make life easier for people to live in these places and work in them? So a great topic of conversation right now in, in Australia is around affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, Sydney and Melbourne, remarkably, are amongst the top five most expensive cities in the world for housing Wow. Uh, which in a, po a tiny population of 25 million in the entire country and the new Albanese administration has put a spotlight on this. Uh, our CEO has called for 30% affordable housing on all government land in all new developments with the caveat that it has to have the level of density available to it to pay for the subsidized right. housing, right? Which right. to you and I is a pretty obvious statement of point but to people who seem to work in planning departments is an anathema, right? Um, because, you know, for whatever reason or density. I think these are the things that now on that S point of view, uh, that S comment are really important. And I think if you look around mixed use and housing developments, you know, we're now accepting that you have to have a situation where key workers, service workers that make cities function, not just doctors and nurses and teachers, but people who work as council workers, People who work in cafes, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is a coffee city. You know, yeah, I've noticed. Right? All those people, they've got to live near where they work. Otherwise, a city doesn't right. function. So I think that that S part, when you think S generally, it usually tends or social, just to, for the audience to say, you, you tend to think about, you know, um, improving the lot of people that might be less well off or, you know, and, and that is absolutely part of it. But it's more than that. It's actually integrating communities in a way where a city functions properly. That's kind of how I look at S. That's how we're approaching S. So you, I'll, I'll answer that or I'll, I'll add to that by going back to your question about existing buildings, is that there's not one city in Australia that doesn't have a whole class of buildings that we don't know what to do with, right? And, and particularly kind of post-pandemic, as offices are shrinking their footprints, um, but but they're also, you know, companies are looking to move to nicer buildings, right? Yeah. Um, and and so, I, I mean, certainly from the LA perspective, uh, LA is almost defined by kind of marginal, medium density commercial office buildings that haven't been touched uh, since the 60s and 70s. And, you know, and you sort of look at them and you think, what are we doing with these? So, you know, we're working with uh, developers in Sydney and Melbourne um, where you have these, these dense central business districts. You have the infrastructure in place. You have all this building stock that's going to be stranded. You're going to have to decarbonize it at some point, too. So you're going to have to make some investments into how those operate. So do you shift the brief of those buildings? Can you can you start to introduce mix, mixed use into an office floor plate, right? So I think 
you know, are you converting an office building to affordable housing? Maybe. 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 Yeah. You know, maybe there's maybe there's retail, maybe there's a mix of hotel and residential. I think I think we're gonna see that more and more in our cities because we're not gonna tear these buildings down. I mean, you look at like London where the model of development is going to start to focus on penalizing you if you want to tear a building down, mm. right? There's it's, a cost to it. There's going to be a cost to it because, and you're going to have to make a case that, that from a carbon perspective, that expenditure of tearing a building down and building new is the only viable option because they're, you're, otherwise you're not going to get planning approval, right? Mm. So I, I think, you know, that's a really interesting model to start to say you have to default to reusing what's there. Is that is that a trial or is that actually in place now? I believe this is this is a kind of framework that's emerging from a conversation around the Marks and Spencer department yeah, store yeah. site, right? And so I, I if I were in the property industry, I would be watching that one because how London um, frames that in terms of policy going forward, I think will will be very influential. Mm. Because we can't, you know, we don't have the resources to tear stuff down. And then replace it. Well, it's right? really carbon intensive to do Super that. Super right? carbon if, if we're living in a world now where we accept that emissions intensive activities need to be reduced and we need to decarbonize. And, you know, my earlier point about people not willing to pay for these things is not true now. All our investors are demanding are demanding um, product that is net zero. They want, they are hungry for mm -hmm. a product that meets uh, ESG goals that their own companies, their own sovereign wealth funds, their own superannuation funds have set for them. You know, they are coming. I mean, we, we're doing more uh, in green bonds, for example, than mm -hmm. I think we had previously. So this, this is not the case anymore that people aren't willing to pay for these things. Right. Which means then that the idea of refurbing, reusing buildings should make some financial sense because people are willing to pay for not releasing embedded carbon. Yeah, I, th I think so. And I, I think that on the design side, we have to get a lot smarter about making the, that case easy, right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I think contractors look at an existing building and just see, you know, like you look behind the curtain and there's just a mess. Place is a disaster, let's get rid of it. Right, yeah. like it's just easier to tear it down. And I think we have to kind of, we, we in design have to figure out models that can kind of quickly de-risk a project. So one of the things we, we look at are digital twins and yeah. the idea of really quickly kind of 3D mapping and digitizing an existing building into something that you can use to scenario test, you know, and to, to what I, I mean, just what I said, you're de-risking the investment. I'm a huge fan of, of digital twins in property development now because you can, that scenario testing element is just, it makes such a difference in the whole commercial framework for how you set up a new project, right? If you can actually test 10 scenarios of how you do something. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like this is easy. No, uh, I mean, no. if, you, if you look at AMP's beautiful building that they've built at Circular Key, uh, it, the cost differential between keeping the core and not keeping the core was marginal at best. Like it, it wasn't keeping the core was a massive winner in terms of cost. We have not figured out the cost uh, elements of this yet in mm -hmm. terms of how you can refurb, how you can refurb building and get an A grade product like that, or or um, you know, or how you actually change use. I think these are all emerging things. I, I want to pick up one point that you just made around mixed use in commercial office, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you just come back from uh, hanging out with half a million property people. You tell me, right? The, there's a view that commercial office is commercial office. You can never have residential in it. Uh, other view that residents don't want to live in a building that has a you know a mixed commercial office. Couple of master plans now emerging in in the Sydney market where you do have commercial in the podium, residential on top. And I would say some doubt around the commerciality of these buildings. What do you see? I would say um, let's let's show the evidence because I, I mean so I let me like this is the response I give to people who say they want uh, in in Los Angeles that they want the city to develop housing for homeless. I just don't want it on my block, right? It's so I'd rather have somebody sleeping in my uh, in the alley behind my house apparently than a 
tra- you know, transitional housing development on the corner of my block. Street, here we call right? it NIMBYism. Right. Well, yeah, it's Not NIMBYism in there too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's the same. It's par- partly the same thing, which is, um, you know, show me where it's been done and then I'll do it. But also that show me the evidence that people won't live in that because in L- again in LA there are people living in garages right there are people living in um Winnebago's on the street right Pe- people will live in anything yeah because there's no place to live that's not right? an a grade commercial building though that's not an a grade commercial yeah. building you're right but what i'm saying is that is that alternative living arrangements are all around us if you're looking and and I, I hope this isn't too controversial, but all of those property people I was hanging out with probably aren't seeing that because that's outside of the realm of a great property development, right? Mm-hmm. Which is everyone's focused on. Like, look at look at the city. Look at the way people live. Like, I think that if you had affordable housing, ten floors on top of a commercial office building, I think you would be surprised how quickly that would fill up. But yes, I agree. The affordable housing would fill up, but would the office even market rate? Oh, would would office? I mean, I think it depends. I think that's where you have to look at um, the reputation. Well, okay, I think you you would find a whole client base of people who want to be associated with mm. a kind of progressive development, right? Like one of the things that our interiors practice talks a lot about is how tenants are picking buildings. Um, based on the community of the building, right? Tenants tenants aren't, you know, progressive tenants aren't going to a building and just saying, oh, put me on level 20, I don't care, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, they want to see, well, does the building have uh, recycling, uh, you know, d- uh, composting? Does the building have a social, you know, a social program? Does the building have an organic restaurant, you know, vegan restaurant downstairs? I mean, who are the other tenants in the building? Can I meet them? Right? Are they people that we might have synergies with our in our business model? I think identity and culture is super important. And I think if you ha- if somebody would like a Lindley's go out there and develop a model like that, I think you'd be surprised at how successful it is. And I, I'm sure it exists in the world, right? Probably yeah, yeah, Scandinavia. I don't. I know. mean, we've got it in one of our buildings, Thirty Van Ness in San Francisco, mm. uh-huh. has a sort of mixed use model. Um, Driven by the city of San Francisco, I must right, say, but right. but I, I actually uh, you know I agree with you on this. I think there is a there is a market differentiation and leadership role of property companies to test and learn to see if product is different. You know, like um, we, you know we we are big on timber buildings. We love them at Barangaroo. We've got two of them. Uh, the first timber residential building then lease built was 15 years ago in Melbourne called right. Forte, right? Right. At that time, people thought we were on drugs, right? Uh, this was well before my time, but you know, you're building a building out of timber. Now everybody wants to do timber. The new Atlassian building is, you know, timber structures everywhere. So I agree with that. I think there is a, particularly in this post-pandemic world, there is an opportunity to change thinking about what a building is and. Is an office building just an office building anymore? Or is it a vertical community? You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is you know why can't you have a mix of um, why can't you have a mix of of use types in a building? You know, you can separate it out by core if you need to, or design if you want to separate commercial from residential. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's some. You're the designer. You tell me, right? I'm I mean, just thinking about it from a market point. But of here, here's the interesting thing, right? Is that we. Um, is that we seldom learn from our mistakes, I find. And um, we talk in architecture about open buildings and, the, and flexibility. Um, and you, don't see, you actually don't see it that often in practice. Mm-hmm. And we, we were talking about this earlier this afternoon, actually, and the idea of like um, designing a commercial office building that has a, a, a side core um, allows you uh, to flex what that building could be in the future in a way that a central core wouldn't let you. Yeah, so right? a future use plan, right? Yeah. And so so think how many, like you can probably count on one hand how many buildings have a side core. Actually, there's 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 more than a dozen, probably a dozen buildings in the CBD with, with that kind of core situation because of the unique quality of Sydney's CBD quality and quotes maybe. But 
Um, <laughs> but easy, I'm easy time. I, well, I'm just thinking <laughs> of all the little weird laneways and the way the streets go. It's like it's it, not. It, it is a jumbled. It ain't Manhattan, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but but looking back, um, you know, and I'm just thinking about kind of the easy wins around adaptive reuse and retrofits of buildings were a lot of these 19th century structures that had big ceilings and big windows because they were daylit. You know, they had massive undifferentiated spaces, um, you know, in, 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 in some ways, or like think of the warehouses, think of like carriage works. You know, these are, these are typologies that lent themselves very well to open-ended program, right? Yeah. You could really, like you could have put residential into carriage works if you wanted to, right? I mean, I toured, when I was in Adelaide, I walked through um, Tonsley Park, uh, which was like a, 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 a car manufacturing facility that was converted to an innovation district, right? And they, they kept the roof and created this amazing kind of like indoor-outdoor park, right? It's an incredible space. It's very cool, isn't it? And so, yeah. like a lot of those projects are done, right? And so now we're left with the ninth, with the twenty story seventies office building with the mirror glass, mm. and we're seeing we're really pushing up against that, saying, you know, like wow, what do you? They're not that flexible. You really have to start taking them apart, and you know, do you remove a floor? Right? Are there are there other ways to think about this? that you can't just look at it like a 19th century or early 20th century office building, right? That it just is easily converted into creative office or condos or whatever, right? Um, we, we have to develop new ways of thinking through those typologies because they, they were designed to do one thing and they did it very efficiently for a very short period of time in our history, right? Um, and we can't afford to tear them down so I think we just we have to start pushing some of these models. That's really where I think government plays a role. Yeah, you know, in 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 how can code officials, fire officials, make this easier for us, right? How can we work with the lift, the lifting strategies, and the the egress to make these buildings functional for other uses? Um, I think there's a lot that still has to be worked out, but I think you know they're in the middle of our city, so. You could really, um, you know, there's no question to me that there's a market there. Well, that's a good segue into the business case for Net Zero, right? Which was the the original premise. Um, And I agree with your point on this partnership between government and the private sector on these questions. Because these, these, in my mind, these questions are not resolved. We haven't got a, uh, we haven't, we haven't quite learned all that we need to learn about this. Right. But uh, but you say there's a business case. I would say first of all, right? That the surely the business case, if we uh, if we agree with climate change, is the planet is going to through unbelievable amounts of damage, and unless we change the way we practice things and we reduce our level of pollution and we reduce our impact on the planet, therefore we have to change anyway. So in in public economics, we would argue that that would be. The business case for it, right? That they're basically that there are public costs that need to be privatized in some way through whatever system. So that would be one perspective of it. But you argue there's actually a private business case for it. So I'm curious as to what your argument has been. Well, so you know, I, I always dispel this myth with anyone that it's like I've never ever in my entire career worked on a project where a developer said, Oh, I'll pay for that. Because it makes me feel good. Exactly. Never. Yeah. You know, and I've worked for governments, I've worked for nonprofits, I've worked for for profit, you know, you name it. Um, I've always had to make a business case. And um, and so what what I think is interesting is how easier it is for me to make that business case today. And certainly from a California perspective, you know, my clients are having serious impacts to their business because of the climate crisis. What type of impact? Well, I mean, extreme heat, right, is is overtaxing our energy grids. It's uh, it's leading to wildfires, which mm-hmm. have huge impacts on uh, a company's um, staff, right? And and so some of that has changed with the pandemic as people uh, there's more flexible working arrangements and people can actually work fairly productively from home. 
Um, which of course then throws into question, well, what's the value of the real estate that no one's using? I mean, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but I would say, uh, you know, extreme heat, the drought, of mm -hmm. course, plays out in so many different ways in a state like California. I mean, we're just in a mega drought and and there's kind after of wildfires year before. after wildfires yeah. the year before. It's actually we, not we, that different to Australia. It's right. Almost. It's not. It's not. And everybody, you know, on my trip, everyone's like, oh, you're in Sydney and it's not raining. You know, you won the lottery. <laughs> But it's like, well, yeah. I know you've had a lot of rain, but it's also kind of an anomaly. Like you you will have rain events. They will be more intense, but then you'll also have drought, right? Just wait. Um, so you're not, it's not like you solved the water crisis because you had a rainy year. Yeah, quite. Right. And that's the same in, in, in California, right? We'll have a rainy year again. I'm sure we will. But we're, the long story is there. So I'm just seeing, you know, our client's business impacted by these real events um, and so they're thinking, well, okay, what, you know, what are the vulnerabilities to my business? What are the vulnerabilities to the people who make my business work? Uh, the supply chain issues that we've all had and continue to have in an entirely unpredictable ways, the lead times you need in, in the construction industry to source the right materials. I mean, those are certainly impacting contractors' abilities. To so your, your framework then is really from a risk perspective. Like to, Absolutely. Here are a bunch of risks that if we don't do these sorts of things on this particular project, there are there are there there is a probability of cost, yeah. and we should factor that in to the financial, uh, we, the commercial assessment of this thing. I mean, we just bought a whole package of um, future weather data um, for all, all of our studios uh, locations. So in Sydney, we, have, we, we now have a future weather file based on a UN IPCC climate change scenario, worst case, um, because we actually think designing for future climate risk is more important than using historical weather data to tell us how our building would operate, right? And it, it's not so much that, that as an architecture practice, we are trying to, uh, you know, predict the future and it's it's and and that we have some sort of magic you know pill that's going to solve all these problems by proving by having, rather difficult predicting the it future. is very future yeah. or it's very it is very difficult but it's an acknowledgement that we have to design for uncertainty we need some evidential basis to to wrap our heads around this and we need to start having that conversation because you know i think you can look at the way we're building and it's still, it's, you know, and in, in, in we were talking about why aren't we doing these hybrid building retrofits is because the property business, real estate business wants precedence, mm. right? And so- How do I make this commercially stack up? Which so is how, the question I was kind of asking. Right? right. So how do we, you know, so we have to provide some evidence that these investments are actually in response to a risk model, right? And so I think that, you know, like I said, in California, I don't have to make that argument that hard because those future risks are happening right now. And are you seeing that in other jurisdictions? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you're seeing this in sort of London or, or, or other jurisdictions generally? Right. I mean, you know, would you think that air conditioning, if you're doing a retrofit project in central London on a building without air conditioning, you think you're putting in air conditioning now? Mm. We probably are. Yeah. Right. And we can't afford to put air conditioning everywhere. Or at least you're looking at different ways of actually cooling the building, right? Right. right. Um, you know, because if you can avoid powered air conditioning, you should try to do so, right? Right. Um, yeah. I, I, that, that is an interesting perspective, I think, around the risk profile of a long-term development. And I think, you know, one of the things I've been reflecting on is, you know, this concept of useful life, you know, mm -hmm. projects come to the end of useful life in depreciation terms all the time, right? But should they become end of useful life in structural terms, the longer we can, the, the technology is getting better where buildings last a lot longer, but don't necessarily meet market dynamics at a particular time. So that's the question around this retrofit question, right? You know, your other point, I was reflecting while you were speaking on, on trends. And, you know, one of the arguments that our development managers have all the time is on car parking, right? Right. So for example, you know, Sydney siders love residential apartments with car parking, uh, as they do in most jurisdictions. But if you talk to uh, a, a lot of people who are in the field that you are in, young people are driving less. They have lower levels of car ownership. Uh, they don't bother driving. They just catch an Uber or mm -hmm. something, right? 
um, or, or car share or something like that, which then means, well, what do you use car parking for? And so there's two questions. One, do you build buildings with car parking? Increasingly, governments are saying, no, you're not going to have car parking or you have much less car parking or, you know, there'll be one car park for every five units or something like that. Or they are um, or they are arguing that car parks must be reused into something else or re you know, uh, you know, some kind of adaptive reuse. Right? Storage is often a common one. What do you think? I mean, that's that's a hard one because it, it definitely depends on the city. Um, and so I don't know. Let's just California let's just, is a car state. Uh, I mean, Los Angeles is a car right, state, right? Yes. Yeah, and I, and I know that there are some precedents of new parking garages being built with, uh, you know, with a structural um, bay size that would support future development redevelopment as something else, right? Because you're you're putting all this carbon into the concrete. So what else can you get with that structure where you're not ramp, you're not ramping the decks, you're creating a ramp off to the side, right? So so there are models for that. I don't think that's the answer either. Um, I, I do think that in a in a place like Los Angeles, it's which is so defined by car culture, but it's also such um, a sort of matrix city. It's you know, it's not high, high density. It's not super low density either, um, but it's it doesn't have a center. There is no center, mm. right? And so it, it will always be this kind of dispersed field uh, situation. And I do, so I do think that the private vehicle will always have a role there. Mm. Um, I, I think, so when I look at LA, I think that the challenges are very different um, than say Sydney because uh, we are developing infrastructure there around trains but I think that will always only serve a certain population, right? Uh, and, and I think cars will always be there. Um, so I think the challenge in LA is how do you create an electrical infrastructure mm. to support EVs without having to upgrade every electrical service of every building? I think that's a real challenge. Or the power grid. Or the power whole. grid itself, right? Like the challenges now, like I read in the paper today, that, that um, because of the strain on the power grid, people are being encouraged not to charge their cars right. at the moment because of peak period pressure on the grid, right? And we're very much in this transitional phase, aren't yeah. we, where more and more jurisdictions are encouraging, um, are encouraging EV take-up. Uh, several countries have banned sale of uh, combustion engines by 2030, 35. I think Britain has, I think Germany is looking at it. I don't think they've acted mm. on it yet because they are a car producer. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I'm quite sure states here will be looking at it. Um, so there is this question. And then, you know, actually, speaking of grid infrastructure, the, the bigger question as well around net zero is if we're transitioning away from fossil fuel energy and we're moving to renewable energy, be it wind, solar, or hydrogen, or whatever, you then have these place, these sorts of types of generation are located in different places to where um, uh, legacy generation is, which means you need, mm. uh, need new transmission networks. Right. So right. the government here has a huge scheme called Rewiring the Nation. It's $20 billion, basically looking at hooking up new renewable energy zones for the future. And people are kind of going, wow, well, that's that's a power price, that's a power price increase because consumers pay for these things, which then puts pressure on the whole. Well, why are we moving too fast to a to energy transition question? Right. I mean, I think people in Britain are probably asking that question right now, right? Given what they're facing, even with price caps and whatever else. So I think we're in this very interesting transitional phase. Well, I, I think I think one use for all of this parking, if if it truly starts to become redundant, is energy storage. Yeah. And I'm not saying we put a bunch of lithium ion batteries. Don't. That's not what. That's not what I think we. I think that's a transitional technology. But some form of energy storage we will have to have because, as we do intensify um, the demand on the grid across the city, um, you know, we'll have to generate more power across the city. I mean, distributed energy. Uh, generation is where it's going, 100%. and we'll have to have battery storage. We'll have to have district microgrids. Um, it, it will. Ha we we simply will not be able to to fully transition at a at a kind of energy is somewhere else and it gets transmitted here model. Yeah. Right. 
That's yeah. certainly not where California I mean, Australia is. I mean, that's, I mean, it's interesting to hear the Californian case, but Australia has a huge adoption of solar um, on uh, uh, domestic solar. I think we're at 20% or something penetration. Uh, commercial office, interesting concepts around hydrogen uh, being stored in metal hydrides, that type of concept around commercial buildings, factories, um, you know, industrial. I think that demonstrates that concept you were talking about, about distributed energy generation beyond wind and solar. And we talk about renewables, yeah. we, we get stuck on wind and solar, but actually we're moving beyond that towards mm -hmm. hydrogen could well be a baseload power, uh, power source, as we're seeing in South Australia. In fact, the Premier of South Australia was, was saying just the other day, I, I had the privilege of catching up with him over breakfast, um, and he... Uh, he was saying that they're, you know, they're procuring a hydrogen power station in South Australia right now. They've gone really into that. What is the Californian case in that sense? Do you have similar levels of solar penetration? Oh, I mean, yeah, I would, I would say it's kind of, it's been too successful. I don't know the percentage off the top of my head, but it is, um, it, it's now where you've got the utilities kind of pushing back on homeowners putting too much solar in. Yeah. So so they're capping because they're it, feeding back into because the they're feeding back into the grid. And the way that it was organized to incentivize solar uptake was utilities would pay market rate for that energy, um, and the utilities are saying, hey, you know, if they're going to be if 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 you're generating power at your house, I'm going to buy it at wholesale, right? I'm not I'm, paying you a retail fee to travel, right? Here. Exactly. So I I think that you know it's it's a it's a complicated market, and I mean we'd be here all night if we were talking about the energy market in California because you have community uh, choice aggregators that will generate power. I mean the utilities are shifting to transmission only, right? So other people are coming into the market to to uh, around generation. Every county has commissioned studies looking at open land to develop solar resources across the state. It's a very diversified market. I, the, the gas companies are investing in looking at hydrogen studies. Could they, could they convert from a fossil gas company to a clean hydrogen company? I mean, California is the only state in, in America that has any hydrogen facility whatsoever. I mean, you can actually buy a hydrogen fuel cell car from Toyota, I think offers one in California and in, in LA, and you can fuel it in LA. Mm. You really just can't leave LA. So there are actual hydrogen, domestic fueling, hydrogen fueling, fueling stations. stations. Do I think, so I think but the that, vehicle itself is very expensive, isn't it? Well, it's, it's subsidized. It's already So subsidized. it's, okay. it's affordable. I mean, I'm not saying that you, it's like $10,000. But, you know, is it less than a Tesla? Yes, yeah. it is. So okay. it's, it's, it's certainly affordable to the market, but it's very limited. Um, and I, I, you know, I do think that there's been a bit of a pivot away from hydrogen in, in the States, uh, but it's still, it's still there. I think the challenge is how do you make it? Mm. You know, and is yeah. that process a green process? Yeah. Somebody has to figure that out. Well, here, I mean, the, the leaders here, Fortescue, Future Industries, are saying it's green. Right, it's not blue, it's not gray, it's not pink, it's green. So, <laughs> it has to be. So anyway, I want to take you back a little bit to the government um, side of things because we should address that. So the, the business case for net zero, I kind of get your perspective now. It's about risk, right? And factoring that risk into a commercial assessment, if, I, if I'm translating you correctly. Yeah, I think, I think that's the hell. I'm... So that makes sense to me. But the path to this stuff is dependent on regulators and legislators and policy setting people who you and I both spend a tremendous amount of time with. Our good people have a desire to do, you know, do the best for their state, their country, their uh, jurisdiction. How do we help them? Um, well, I think I think there has to be some market. There definitely has to be some market pressure. So. Um, you know, when I compare L.A. and New York, for example, two of my favorite cities, um, New York uh, is taking a big stick approach, right? They have they have uh, they've revised their building code uh, to require buildings to improve their carbon footprint based on a sort of stepped approach. And so they started out by having buildings report on their footprint every year. So they started mandatory energy reporting. Um, they built up that, that kind of culture and now they're regulating carbon. And 
And if you don't meet your carbon target, which is specific to your building, then you're fined. And so the incentive there is, well, if I'm going to pay a fine, why don't I take that money and decarbonize yeah. with it? Because I'm going to get a return. Because um, I'm going to have to do so it. So I'm eventually. investing the fine into. <laughs> right. I'm avoiding the fine by <laughs> investing it in, yeah. in my own asset, right? So um, L LA is sort of been sitting on its hands. I think I think the answer is there, right? But what's the, the difference is LA is the market. Well, the market's very different. You have a, a lot of what I would call mom and pop developers or building owners, right? Who are knocking at the door. Um, you have, you know, it's it's not your premium high, it's not Lend Lease, right? That that owns the majority of buildings in LA. It's people, it's families who've been holding property, who have a lot of political power. And it's very clear, I think, I mean, I don't think it's risky to say that our city council in LA is very beholden to this layer of the of the property business. And I think it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to say that's one of the reasons we don't have a decarbonization policy in place that's forcing it from, from the government side. So to me, I think that's where if if I were um, if I were an asset, if I were a portfolio building owner and I wanted to reposition my assets to take advantage of a post-pandemic changing commercial landscape, I would use decarbonization and rethinking the programmatic mix of our buildings like we've been talking about, right, as a way to reposition it, get ahead of the policy, which which will eventually have to happen. Um, oh, so it's a planning strategy is what you're arguing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and but but I think that it would start to put pressure from the on the from the private sector perspective that other developers, you know, other owners would have to start to meet. Because you're setting a new ambitious standard that is right. attracting capital to it. Right. So it's a bit like how we we're talking about taking a lead on sustainability first and other followers following. Yeah, I can see that. Because I think I think the you know the the organizations that own their building right like the the tech companies they're taking this seriously because they see this happening globally to their operations so that's that risk model they want to de-risk their assets they want to get ahead of it they also have ambitious ESG targets right so so there's there's a that's a different so I'm I'm talking more about that layer down mm. right who are not the listed corporates or the or the large privates who are. Who are who are asset owners who aren't necessarily exposed to ESG pressure or right. anything else? They've got to they've got to act because not acting will cost them money. And that's a yeah. huge impact to our cities. It's a huge impact to public health, and it's a huge opportunity for you know a company like Woods Bagot to think about how do we how do we design a model that works like that that's attractive that that we can really reposition those assets. I mean, it's a Opportunity it, it goes. It anybody. goes back to your point, though, around no one does anything unless it makes commercial sense to do so. It's the same for that layer as well. Like you know, if you've got an asset that's yielding well for you, you know, and somebody says to you, you've got to invest a whole bunch of capital in this. Um, you know, your your question would be, and what's my return? That would generally be the question, right? right? So. This is where I think all of these different factors we've been talking about come into it. We'll have to end soon. It's a fascinating <laughs> conversation. Uh, we could go on for, for a while. But yeah. um, if I was to say to you three things that you think need to happen to progress this discussion around sustainability that you would love to see happen, what would they be? <laughs> Gosh, can they be things we haven't talked about? Sure, they can be whatever you feel like. <laughs> right. Um, well, okay. So to stick with the topic around carbon, um, I would say that one thing that I would love to have happen is a kind of mandatory uh, EPD requirement. EPD? Uh, environmental Product uh, Declaration. Okay. Um, so this is, where, this is how you build up a carbon footprint of a material or a system or an assembly, whatever, a product. Um, so it's the, it's the component for a life cycle assessment, um, or it's the it's the out, outcome of a life cycle assessment is an EPD, and that's what we're using in our industry to to really d assess carbon, right? Of of embodied carbon, right? This is not the operational carbon; that's a modeling exercise. So I think we just do not have enough data yet on our impact to really be. Um, 
to, to do that in a, in a, uh, what I want to say, grant, not granular way, but, it, but in a very, um, precise way, right? We're still feel, filling in a lot of blanks mm. on an embodied carbon model, which is okay. I mean, it's not, not the end of the world, but I think, you know, to your point, it's like, we need the data. We need to be able to measure it, right? If we're going to affect change, because sometimes when you look at the data, it reveals things that you wouldn't have known otherwise, right? If you actually measure it. Um, and so I think we're still really early at that. And not all industries uh, are really up to speed on, on having us the data. So that's, that's one thing. Okay. Um, the, second, the second thing is the social impact of supply chains. Um, I think, you know, the conversation I've been having with a lot of our clients in Australia uh, is that it's who, like, who in the room has a modern slavery policy? And everybody raises their hands. Who in the room actually knows that the stuff that, that is in your supply chain for your, your product, maybe it's a building, maybe it's something else, that you know, that you know, you know, for without a shat, with a shadow of a doubt, with, with, you know, with no doubts that, that actually there's no exploited or forced labor contributing to that supply chain. Like nobody can raise their hand. And, and I always use the example of like Apple, you know, the world's richest company, like even they can't mm. confirm that that exploited labor is not contributing to their products. And so this is this is a challenge for all of us. And I think anybody who's wielding a but you know, multiple millions of dollars of budgets around procurement, you know, like we we need to really know who's providing those materials, those assemblies, those products, and are they treated well, yeah. right? And so I think the human rights question is something that is an emerging issue in, in the AEC architecture, engineering, construction industries and the real estate industry. But I think it's absolutely critical. Um, so those are two things that I would, if I could snap my fingers, I'd say we'd have sorted those out and then you wouldn't need me. <laughs> <laughs> so then maybe the third one should be something like, you know, can I just, uh, um, you know, live at Bondi Beach, um, you know. Well, no, no, now that you no longer need it after the second one. <laughs> Fantastic. Look, uh, look I, think, I think the future is very exciting in this space, right? I think, you know, I love the fact that there's this transition happening and that we don't actually know what the answer is because it means that we actually have to think about it and actually come together and, and talk more like this about how you solve some of these challenges. And, and I think in particular on the S side, on the social side, if this results in better cities for people that make life easier for people in some of the cities we haven't spoken about, lots of the emerging developing cities that are large, uh, they're very large and have huge social problems within them. Um, if some of these questions, that we, if we answer some of these questions and they can improve the lives of people living in cities, I think uh, as an industry, we've done great work. Yeah. Before the moment, Russell Fortmeyer. Thank you so much for being part of Smarter Cities. All right. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure.